So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. And it's an honor to be able to introduce Christian Sorensen, who is a novelist and independent journalist, uh, mainly focused on the corporations profiting from war. An Air Force veteran, he's the author of the book, Understanding the War Industry. Christian is also a senior fellow at the Eisenhower Media Network, an organization of independent veteran military and national security experts. His work is available at warindustrymuster.com. Welcome, Christian, and take it away. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Peace Action Maine. Thank you, everyone, for having me. I sincerely appreciate this. I'm going to share my screen now, and we should have the slideshow. Can you give me a thumbs up if you see that? Nice. Excellent. All right. Here we go. So I've been asked to discuss briefly at the beginning how I got started studying the war industry. I was in the Air Force for a few years, got out in 2011. And during my time in uniform, I started studying a little bit, having a bit of a political awakening. And so when I got out, I continued that journey. And first as a hobby, decided to go to the Pentagon's website, which uh, every duty day at 5 p.m. displays the contracts that it has signed that day. So I started as a hobby collecting these and distilling them and trying to understand who profits from war. And over time, it developed uh, into a more of a passion. And now I have several years of analyzing these contracts and enough data to uh, speak with some um, authority, for lack of a better word, about uh, who's profiting from war. So that's sort of the background to this. And um, here we are today. So what is the military industrial congressional complex? I'm just going to get everyone on the same page and then we can get into Maine in specific and uh, general dynamics as well. So the military industrial congressional complex, also known as the Iron Triangle, is an insulated authority, consists of the US military establishment headquartered in the Pentagon. The US war industry is another side of the triangle. That's the corporations that develop, market, and sell goods and services to the US military, to US intelligence agencies, and to allied capitalist governments, regimes around the world. And the third side of the triangle is Capitol Hill. And the job of Capitol Hill, largely, is to shut up and to pass legislation in favor of the permanent warfare state. Profit is the driving force, the driving force of US foreign policy. Now the US ruling class deploys the military worldwide for three main reasons. To forcibly open up countries for exploitation, usually to uh, multinational corporations. Number two, to ensure the free flow of natural resources out of the global South. And number three, which is what I focus on, because war is big business. So what is capital? Capital is money that is used to expand business in order to make more money. An example of this is building new factories to produce more goods from which to profit. To make more money, more and more parts of everyday life must be pulled into capital to be exchanged for money. So we see everything in civilian life being commodified. Food, housing, land, water, your personal data, all of this is up for grabs. It doesn't matter that these are basic human rights or fundamental necessities that's irrelevant to the capitalist. This is also why we see corporations taking over many military functions. So a given corporation is now in charge of what was once a governmental job, once basically what the troops used to do. Now the troops still are around and they still um, you know, have work to do, but that they are viewed by industry more as vessels. And the bases are avenues 
These are vessels and avenues for corporate profit. So the given corporation needs to get a layer of profit out of whatever task it has taken over. So in order to get that profit, corporation will charge a lot or cut jobs or pollute or reduce labor practices or labor protections rather, or all of the above. This is not just exclusive to the war industry, mind you. All corporations behave in that manner because they must maximize profit. That is why the corporation, particularly the large corporation exists. Capital is also putting money toward cultivating politicians, establishing think tanks, funding media in order to get a pro-war narrative out there, and eventually attaining a military so rife with corporations that it becomes one bloated self-justifying profitable entity, which is what we have today. It is so enormous and so bloated. It, it essentially governs, there's nobody in charge aside from the corporate profit. There's nobody in charge. Generals, they come and they go. Capital is also arranging industry pressure groups, which is something that doesn't get talked about enough. The National Defense Industrial Association is a good example, uh, which along with think tanks, encourage and award high-ranking military officers who support and extend conflicts overseas. So if we saw, for example, uh, one of the demons of the day, Russia, if we saw a corporation, many corporations get together and establish a pressure group, sometimes called the trade association, and that corporate entity awards an active duty four-star general in Russia, we would say, hey, these Russians, they're so corrupt. That's ridiculous, but that's us. That's what we do. That's what happens in and around the uh, Beltway on the regular. Uh, Four-star Marine General Joe Dunford uh, received an award from the National Defense Industrial Association. I think it was called, ironically enough, or not ironically enough, the Eisenhower Award. So that's corporations awarding a sitting four-star general and then not surprisingly, he got off, um, excuse me, he retired with his six-figure pension from the U.S. government and then went to work for Lockheed Martin. I mean, this is, this is how the system works. Capital is also marketing and pushing and operating goods and services that harm populations and destabilize countries around the world, generating even more profitable conflict. All right, so let's get to general dynamics. General dynamics is perhaps the most uh, diverse war corporation in terms of its different segments. So every large war corporation has many different business segments, different ways to profit from different aspects of war. So on the screen now, you see the different business segments of General Dynamics. Now, the one that concerns us primarily today is under the Marine Systems Division, it's Bath Ironworks. And other parts of Marine Systems our electric boat, which is down in Groton, Connecticut, and NASSCO, which is uh, National Steel and Shipbuilding Company. It uh, is in San Diego, California. It's in uh, Bremerton, Washington, Washington State. And um, it is in Norfolk, Virginia as well. And I believe Mayport, Florida. But we'll get back to that. So the corporate mentality, if you rise through the ranks in a corporation, particularly a huge corporation, you... Um, put profit over people, and that's putting it very nicely. To ascend to the top of the corporate world, particularly the war corporate world, one must not just put profit over people. Empathy is shunned, mutual aid is shunned in favor of the most ruthless and harmful attributes that a human can have. Deception, ruthless competition, exploitation. There was a study a few years back um, that the Telegraph over in the UK picked up and their title was one in five CEOs are psychopaths, study finds. Now, one could argue that that uh, fraction is higher in war corporations. So who are the main profiteers in General Dynamics? Here's the lineup. Uh, the man or the gentleman, shall I say, perhaps, who is, concerns us today, president of Bath Ironworks, Dirk Lesko. He, I believe, worked his way up. Um, he's not your traditional corporate executive who has either rotated in and around the MIC or who has come in from another war corporation to take over 
as happens with some of the leaders of the medium-sized war corporations and even the larger ones. Um, so yeah, that's uh, these are the uh, these are the profiteers. General Dynamics facilities are spread across the country. Here are the most prominent ones that show up in the Pentagon contracts that I study. Bath, Maine, you know. Another, the ones in Massachusetts, Pittsfield, Marion, and Taunton show up fairly regularly. The one in Taunton, for example, works on communications gear. Groton, Connecticut, you know, because of Electric Boat, which works on submarines. The ones in Falls Church in Fairfax in Virginia work on information technology, hardware, software, stuff like that. Other popular ones, Sterling Heights in Michigan is where General Dynamics produces land vehicles. And yeah, those are the most, those are the most popular. So business sectors of war. Business sectors of war are military functions that corporations now run. Large war corporations specialize, as I mentioned, in multiple business sectors of war. These are business sectors of war right here. Can be anything from public relations and consulting to financial advice, audit, finance, accounting, accounting to training and simulation, to transportation, and on and on and on. Information technology is the most frequent type of contract that I come across. It is incredibly lucrative. It is perhaps one of the most lucrative business sectors of war. So take just a moment here and look over these, um, these different sector, uh, business sectors of war. So General Dynamics sells goods and services pertaining to almost all business sectors of war. The only thing that General Dynamics really doesn't do is it builds aircraft. Gulfstream is owned by General Dynamics, but General Dynamics does not build um, fighter jets. Lockheed Martin and Boeing are the only ones who build serious fighter jets. Um, and it doesn't build large aerial refuelers. Boeing does that. Um, yeah, but other than that, General Dynamics does everything. It makes everything from um, uh, large ordnance, like artillery shells, to small caliber uh, bullets for rifles, to everything from uh, you know profiting from space. It runs some of the ranges that um, where satellites are launched. It runs actually some of the ranges with Raytheon. It's in a joint venture called RG Next, Range Generation Next. Anyway, um, so sales. So the US government is the primary customer of large war corporations. US war corporations also sell, as we mentioned, to capitalist regimes around the world. They do this two ways, through direct commercial sales, that is to say corporation to foreign government, or foreign military sales, FMS. FMS tend to deal with big ticket items or goods and services of a sensitive nature. That's why the US government gets involved as an as a intermediary. So under FMS, it is corporation to US government, US government to foreign government. If you wanna get technical, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency is the US government agency that it is the intermediary when it comes to foreign military sales. There's an enormous amount of money at stake. In fiscal year 2020, the US war industry sold $50.8 billion through FMS and $124.3 billion through direct commercial sales. Large war corporations, whether it's Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, General Dynamics, L3 Harris, whatever, have offices around the world to network and to ink deals. So General Dynamics, for example, has facilities in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in Saudi Arabia, in Canada, in Italy. Recent uh, foreign military sales that General Dynamics inked to Iraq, Kuwait, uh, Japan, Egypt. So you look at these, take your time. The first one to Iraq was for land vehicles. The Abrams tank is a General Dynamics product, as well as the Hercules, uh, the M88. It's a big, basically a giant, uh, 
tow truck, basically, when a vehicle gets stuck. Yeah, that's a good overview. So we progress to Maine. What does the war industry look like in Maine? There are some positives when it comes to this. So this is a slide provided by uh, annual or semi-annual report from the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation. It's just one of many Pentagon offices. If you look at where it says top defense contractors, you can see that General Dynamics is by far and away the largest war corporation in Maine, or the, or the war corporation with the largest presence in Maine. And that is Bath Iron Works. So there is reason to be cautiously optimistic insofar as there's only one major war corporation with one major location in Maine. Some other encouraging numbers is 0.7%. And I believe this slide was from fiscal year, I don't know, 2019, maybe. 0.7% of total US military spending is in the state of Maine. So Maine is not swamped with war corporations. It's not like uh, Massachusetts or Virginia or Maryland or Texas or California or even Florida, it is dealing with one major war corporation. Now, if you look at beneath General Dynamics, if you look at the other ones, one for healthcare, Martins Point Healthcare contracts through TRICARE. TRICARE is the major military healthcare blob that provides um, um, relatively um, affordable healthcare to active duty service members and um, some vets some retirees, that is. The rest are basically construction corporations. Methuen, Cianbro, Ellis Black, um, I believe Precision Partners as well, or CCI Energy, all construction corporations. Intermat is the only one that's not a construction corporation. Intermat does, um, it creates surfaces for aircraft. But I, oh, there's only one recent contract that I could find to Intermat. So it's not like it's, it's a huge presence or a massive beast that we must contend with. It's there, but it's not, um, it's not a force to be reckoned with. So General Dynamics, Bath Iron Works, General Dynamics acquired Bath Iron Works, BIW, in the mid-90s. It's been there for a very long time. It was established in, I believe, 1884. It has around 6,000 to 7,000 employees. I sent a few questions to public relations over at General Dynamics in preparation for this. Didn't hear back from them. That is not a, it's not a surprise. So what's General Dynamics Bath Iron Works building now? Uh, two types of ship, two types of destroyer. The Arleigh Burke class, which is built around the Lockheed Martin Aegis system. Aegis system is basically a bunch of gadgets and gizmos and hardware and software that tracks missiles and um, sometimes launches missiles. This is a picture of the Arleigh Burke, of a given Arleigh Burke destroyer. So you have this in your mind when we're talking about this. General Dynamics Bath Iron Works also is producing Zumwalt class destroyers. Now Zumwalt class is one of many war industry products that is delayed, over budget, behind, just behind schedule, Increasingly, you, one can see major products from war corporations underperforming and costing more and more. This is not an anomaly, the Zoom wall class delays. This is what it looks like. It's basically when war corporations, but no matter what they are, no matter which corporation it is, they promise the moon they say, hey, Pentagon, we can deliver A, B, C, D, no problem. And they're not required to have a uh, functioning prototype before the Pentagon says, all right, we're going to you know, buy a ton of these. So it's just another case of corporate capture. The corporation is in charge, not really the Pentagon. I mean, there's some back and forth there, but neither entity 
has any reason to arrest nonstop war or to, to push back firmly against the other. So Defense News is one of many military themed periodicals out there. And even if you don't believe in their editorial line or sometimes their pro-war slant, it's good to read these, these um, magazines online because they report fairly well. If you can read through um, some of the editorial stance, they report fairly well on the war industry. They won't call it that, but they'll report on it and they'll report on um, US militarism. So it's one of many news sources that I encourage you to look at. So Defense News back in January reported the Zumwalt program was supposed to have 32 ships. Costs soared and performance underwhelmed. So, so much so that the Navy cut that number to three ships. You saw this also with, for example, um, the Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor. Now that performance wise was okay, but the costs were just through the roof. So eventually they had to just order not as many um, aircraft. They just, not that money's not an issue, but they're always underlying it is always um, throwing money at more stuff, newer stuff. So it's not necessarily that the, that the, the corporation is held to account by no means. Defense News says in 2018, the Navy announced that the ship's advanced gun system, one of the main reasons for building the ship, would be laid up. The Navy canceled the long-range land attack projectile after it came to light that the cost per round was more than $800,000. Furthermore, the system was also failing to achieve the range, so over budget and underperforming. Task and Purpose, another military-oriented website in May of this year, reported, quote, the Navy is still trying to find a suitable weapon for the Zumwalt nearly five years after it stopped buying the $800,000 per round ammunition for the gun it was supposed to have. I mention this because the third and final Zumwalt is under construction right now at Bath Iron Works. It's an important organizing note for anyone out there in the peace or anti-war movement. The fact that the war industry regularly promises the moon and only comes through with mediocre over budget products is something that you can highlight in your organizing because war corporations to a large extent aren't protecting. There's no defense, it's about money. And that's why this happens. It's about money, they want money. It has nothing to do with defense of the country. So it's not just the Zuma class destroyers that have this over, um, over budget underperformance. Lockheed Martin F-35 is the most famous example, has over 800 flaws that Lockheed Martin has admitted to. Um, and I believe 160, some of them, Lockheed Martin says it's never going to fix. The Boeing KC-46 tanker is a new aerial refueling plane. Back in the day, they refueled, there was somebody in the back, an airman in the back of the plane to fit the boom into the receiving aircraft so they, the aircraft could be refueled. Boeing says, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to have a video system and the guy will sit up front or the, the airman, the guy or the girl will sit up front and we'll use a video system in order to refuel. Now, video system stinks. It has many problems and there are leaks in the aircraft according to the US Air Force. So again, over budget, underperforming, and it goes on and on and on. There's some other examples there. General Atomics, which is most famous for its MQ-9 Reaper drone. Whenever there's a US drone strike, it's usually that drone. General Atomics also has um, a plant, I believe it's in Mississippi, that um, has come up with a new way to launch aircraft from an aircraft carrier. Back in the day, they used to do it with steam and a bunch of pistons. They had it down to a fairly good science. General Atomics says, no, nah, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use uh, electromagnets and system stinks, can't launch any aircraft as of today. So anyway, recent contracts or contract modifications that have come up in um, the Pentagon's uh, website. Work on the Zoom all class. 27 February of this uh, past year, 18 December this past year. So they're still getting contracts for this. Recent, other recent contracts at Bath Iron Works, um, many for the Arleigh Burke, more for the Arleigh Burke than the Zumwalt. One of the contracts you see there in the middle, Arleigh Burke class program funds were given to Bath Iron Works for shipbuilder and supplier base efforts to quote, address supply chain fragility and to ensure future readiness for the fleet. You see this type of language increasingly in Pentagon contracts. 
where it is more corporate language than Pentagon language. And you'll see, um, and I'm happy to you know, talk about this more in question and answer if you want, um, uh, several examples of corporate um, claims without, without any um, backing up, any support, any substance in Pentagon contracts. Um, yeah, so we'll keep going. Other war corporations show up in Maine, but are not, um, not a force to be reckoned with at this stage. So you know Raytheon. You know it's enormous. It's one of the top two uh, US war corporations. It, in a recent merger with United Technologies Corporation, acquire, um, is now uh, one part of United Technologies Corporation. Oh, okay, getting ahead of myself. Raytheon and United Technologies Corporation merged. They had a quote merger of equals recently. And the new corporation is now called Raytheon Technologies. One of the resulting business segments of that new corporation is Pratt & Whitney. Pratt & Whitney is headquartered in East Hartford, Connecticut. It makes aircraft engines, including those for the F-35 that we talked about. Pratt & Whitney has a plant in North Berwick, Maine. And this comes up once in a while, not often, once in a while in Pentagon's contracts. So for example, on 8 September, 2020, there was a contract to work on F-35 engines. And 11% of that work was allocated to North Berwick. Now, you know that war corporations spread work around the country, across congressional districts in order to capture Congress. That's one way they capture Congress. They also lobby, they also use campaign finance. They have many different ways to capture Congress. But this is one of them, it's pretty effective. So once in a while, North Berwick gets some money from uh, Raytheon, Pratt & Whitney. It's important to note. It is not a huge plant, but it's there. And the workers, when we get into conversion, the workers, the working class at any of these plants must be taken care of. That is the priority. That is the number one goal. So I didn't know, I've been to Maine a few times. I didn't know where North Berwick was. There it is, give it to you on the old Google map here. It is north of Kittery. Um, it is west of Kennebunkport. Southern Maine. Note the jobs at this plant. These jobs, as we'll talk about in greater detail, are all applicable to other aircraft engine work. These, are not, these, these jobs do not have to be uh, military related. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because the knowledge is already there. Boeing also is a very small presence. Boeing makes a lot of stuff, many different business segments of war in the Boeing Corporation. One of the products that it has is called the Gigabit Ethernet Data Multiplex System. You do not need to know this name, GEDMS. It is a data transfer network used on Navy ships. It is also used on the Arleigh Burke class destroyer. A recent contract in May of this year went to Boeing for GEDMS design. 12% of that work was given to workers in Bangor, Maine. So Boeing sent some of that to Bangor, Maine, some of the work that is. It's important to keep in mind, it, is, it almost never shows up in the Pentagon's contracts, but it's there. Corporate America pitches these upgrades to ships like the GEDMS as allowing the Navy to reduce manpower, fewer sailors to feed, clothe, and pay, while increasing safety via more sensors and remote monitoring. And largely the Pentagon gobbles up these corporate talking points. There's no pushback, there is none whatsoever. The, the, the Pentagon has so thoroughly embraced neoliberal economic policies that Whatever corporate America says, especially the fundamentals, there's no pushback from the Pentagon. Other corporate work shows up at um, the Portland Naval, Sh Naval Shipyard in, um, in Kittery. But these corporations are not, don't have a, a long-term presence there at all. So just some examples. 
a few corporations from one from South Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, another one from Virginia, all together in September were contracted to support projects and repairs at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Those are some of the jobs there. All of those jobs, mind you, are applicable to non-military ships, sheet metal, insulator, blaster, marine ship fitter. All of these can be used on civilian ships. Khaki, Khaki is a very, um, very sly corporation, shall we say. It does a lot of contracting with military intelligence. Uh, that's not its primary uh, means of getting money, but um, it does everything, anything to do with hardware or software. Uh, and as you know, US intelligence, civilian and military is heavily IT based, heavily information technology based. Um, so in March of this year, Khaki was contracted for all sorts of services at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, engineering, technical, administrative, managerial. And I believe this contract had to do with um, a Khaki software product that they use. Lidos out of Maryland, June this year, 1% of this contract workload was at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard because it dealt with systems, surface, ship, underwater, undersea warfare systems. And Lidos is one of the many uh, larger corporations that works on the systems that go on the ships, whether it's warfare for surface warfare or for undersea. Pentagon contracts sometimes involve other locations in Maine, rarely, but I need to, I feel I need to mention this. So for example, in August of last year, Environmental Chemical Corporation of California was contracted to do environmental remediation at Loring Air Force Base, or what was once Loring Air Force Base in Maine. Now, Superfund sites, uh, many of them are former military sites or former war corporation sites that have uh, just been thoroughly polluted. As you all know, the US military is one of the largest institutional polluters in the world. What doesn't get talked about a lot is the different types of pollution. It's not just carbon, not just carbon emissions, and it's not just particulates from exhaust. It is nuclear waste. It is the waste of, for example, if you, they spray this foam in order to put out fires on aircraft, it's highly toxic. It leaches into the soil, the groundwater, it gives people cancer. The military is still using it to this day. So after a military base gets uh, decommissioned or shut down, they need to do environmental remediation. And who pays for that? Taxpayer. Who profits from it? Corporations. Another contract. Uh, I'd never really seen the University of Maine in Pentagon contracts until very recently. And so you, Maine, up in Orono, on June of last year, in June of last year, received some money for research and development of expeditionary maneuver support materials and structures. Okay. Academ um, academia's job is threefold. Primarily, academia's job within the overall US war industry is to research and development technology for uh, military use and for intelligence use. And you see this regularly. University of Maine never really shows up. Johns Hopkins shows up all the time. Georgia Tech shows up all the time. Sometimes University of um, Maryland shows up. University of Dayton in Ohio shows up because the Air Force Research Lab has a, has a branch over there. In any event, um, the other roles that academia play are in whitewashing um, capitalists. So uh, uh, quote unquote philanthropist, a human of immense wealth, billionaires will donate money to a university. And then the university will therefore, that act of quote unquote generosity then whitewashes whatever crimes the capitalist had committed in order to obtain those billions of dollars. Not to mention the oppression of the workers. The workers create the profit. The ruling class takes the profit. So that billionaire couldn't 
get a billion dollars, couldn't get multiple millions of dollars without the workers creating that profit for that billionaire. Um, so yeah, that's important to note regarding academia. Construction, I ought to mention, as you saw at the top, there are a few construction corporations in Maine that receive money for uh, um, military activity construction. Construction is ubiquitous in Pentagon contract. Hundreds of construction firms are hired every year to build and repair military installations. By my count, the Pentagon is the largest employer of construction workers inside the United States. It is harmful in a couple of ways. One is that it effectively co-ops part of the working class, clouding the workers' minds with traditional, quote unquote, patriotic sentiment. And it binds part of the working class economically to nonstop war. Worse yet, military construction physically lays the foundation that expands the permanent warfare state. So every construction contract kicks the can even further down the road. Building a new squadron in Montana, or you're building a new um, secured compartmentalized uh, information facility in Virginia, Northern Virginia, or a new data center in Utah. This expands the permanent warfare state and is just another obstacle in the eventual conversion from a permanent warfare state to an economy that actually benefits humans and the natural world. So large engineering and project management firms contract regularly with the Pentagon. AECOM, Jacobs, RQ Construction, Floor, Tetra Tech, Whiting Turner, you see these regularly. These are the big boys. But smaller local construction firms are the most common type of corporation in construction contracts with the Pentagon. So outside construction firms sometimes come and work in Maine. And when I say outside construction firms, I mean firms that are from other states come to do military related construction or repair in Maine. And here are just two examples. A, corporate, a construction firm from uh, New Hampshire in May of this year was contracted to replace uh, pump test equipment at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Okay. Uh, another corporation in September of last year, this corporation from Massachusetts, this construction firm was contracted to renovate a communications building at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Okay, it's important to know. Main construction firms also get work uh, doing military related construction and repair in May. Cianbro Corporation, February of this year, dredging at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in order to help uh, with a dry dock extension and a corporation from Biddeford uh, in May of this year did, uh, was contracted for some work at the um, old Navy, uh, not a Navy station, but Navy facility up in Cutler, Maine. And that facility used to be used for um, communication with submarines, I believe in the North Atlantic. Um, I thought it was shut down, but apparently not. So quick summary, the major players are General Dynamics, Bath Ironworks, by far and away. By far and away, this is the beast, whether you uh, slice it by um, the amount of money it gets um, or its industrial footprint, this is the one to be concerned with, as you know. But it's also important to know that the workers ought to be taken care of at uh, the North Berwick, uh, Raytheon, Pratt & Whitney plant, and the smaller presence uh, that Boeing contracts to up in uh, Bangor, Maine. I've been asked to touch upon conversion, conversion from military industry to civilian purposes in Maine. And I am cautiously optimistic. I know it's like many of you have been at this for years. Uh, I don't want to make it seem like it's easy. It's absolutely not easy, but there is reason to be optimistic. And I feel like having that hope is important. It keeps us going. It keeps us alive. It keeps us um, you know, on this path. So um, there are relatively few lo locations of war corporations in Maine. It's a good thing, okay? Um, most infrastructure is already in place or adjustable. And what I mean by this is, for example, at General Dynamics Bath Ironworks, already has plenty of infrastructure in place to produce non-military ships. That's key. That disarms one of the arguments that um, a corporate executive would make and say, oh, we can't, you know, this is just for, uh, you know, military purposes. Nonsense. Nonsense. You already have the dry docks. You already have all the employees there. You already have the institutional knowledge. 
you got it. Uh, the Raytheon Pratt & Whitney one in North Berwick can easily make parts for civilian aircraft engines. No problem, no problem. I shouldn't say, use the word easily, but um, it can absolutely make parts for civilian aircraft engines, no problem. It is not a stretch to envision Bath Ironworks building um, wind turbines, hospital ships, not a problem. In fact, General Dynamics uh, National Steel and Shipbuilding Company, which has a presence in San Diego, in Bremerton, Washington, in uh, Mayport, Florida, and in Norfolk, Virginia, already makes other ships, such as cargo ships and fuel ships. So the corporation itself already has the knowledge and the know-how. Advantages of industry conversion, military to civilian in May, more advantages. Jobs are already, are readily applicable to civilian production. If you look at these jobs, jobs at Bath Ironworks, jobs at Pratt & Whitney over in North Berwick, all of these are applicable to civilian production, all of them. You need a crane operator when building civilian ships. You need a welder, you need a boiler operator. It's all civilian jobs or all jobs that are easily uh, applied to civilian industries. Same thing with Raytheon, Pratt & Whitney over in North Berwick. You need design engineers, you need materials analysts, you need parts cleaners, you need quality control, okay? More advantages. Corporations go where the money is. If the money comes down from the top, and if the money is in, say, building infrastructure from some sort of Green New Deal. I know that's a, um, a uh, contentious term these days. Uh, but um, if the money comes down for the top, whether it's a Green New Deal or climate change preparation, whatever, then the construction firms in Maine will be there. Absolutely. They are not wedded by any means to uh, military construction repair. It just so happens that military construction repair is one of the, uh, and in some cases, the only federal funding coming into the state. It's also important to note that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, USACI, and NAVFAC, which is the uh, Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command, already supervise infrastructure projects, already supervise infrastructure projects within the United States. In June alone, infrastructure contracts through those two military organizations dealt with water pumps in St. Louis, earth fill for bluffs in California, dam work on the upper Mississippi, reinforcing islands and march habitat in the Mississippi as well, uh, road work across the country, that is to say um, the repair of um, asphalt uh, and concrete, demolition and construction of a containment dike in Chambers, Texas, surveying and mapping. So the, the contracting avenues are already there. And in the transition from military to civilian industry, we can utilize what is already in place through the Army Corps of Engineers and NAVFAC to as a temporary, uh, temporary funding channels for infrastructure. It's not, it's, not, um, um, it's not a problem. Obstacles are great though. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that we, we should be um, you know, willy-nilly gung-ho here. We've got this. And the main obstacle is the politicians. Politicians uh, are corrupt. Corrupt politicians, that's redundant. They, politicians are corrupt. And that is by the very nature of corporate capture in a capitalist society. They take campaign finance from corporations, including war corporations. They take lobbying from corporations, including war corporations. And Maine senators are not unique. They do it as well. Most senators do it. And most uh, Congress people in general do it. Most representatives do it. So um, this, these, are, these are substantial obstacles. They play the jobs card very well. The corporate executives do. The public relations uh, apparatus within the corporation does. And um, the politicians do as well. They say that they frame corporations, large corporations, as job creators in order to confine the politicians. It's one way they capture Congress. The truth is, <clears throat> for example, during 2012 to 2018, Lockheed Martin cut 15,000 jobs from its workforce 
while it was the top corporate recipient of tax dollars. It doesn't sound like a job creator to me. Quote, and this is, quote is from um, Tom Dispatch. Quote, in short, since 2012, the number of taxpayer dollars going to Lockheed has expanded by billions. The value of its stock has nearly quadrupled and its CEO's salary went up 32%, even as it cut 14% of its American workforce. Yet Lockheed continues to use job creation as well as its employees' present jobs to get more taxpayer money. Corporate America in a nutshell right there. Truth about war industry jobs. And one of the great, um, if I can take a moment, one of the great journalists out there is Taylor Barnes. And she covers um, a lot of the job stuff within the uh, uh, war industry. So look up, uh, look up her work if you, if you get a moment. So the truth about war industry jobs, as she points out, Total war industry employment was roughly 3.2 million in 1985, 1.1 million in 2019. And I expect that number to go down. Because, why? Because corporate America, not just the war industry, but corporate America as a whole, is automating and exporting jobs to the best of its ability because it needs to continue to cut costs. It needs to continue to squeeze as much profit out of its operations as is humanly possible. That is a horrible thing. It is a horrible fact. However, it is something that we can highlight in uh, piecework and in organizing because the corporation does not care. That stat shows that the corporation does not care about you, the worker. You've all seen the cost of war project. I don't need to repeat this. Um, there are many fields that create far more jobs than quote unquote defense. Sustainable infrastructure, education is another one. Uh, healthcare is another one. All of these produce more jobs than defense. Steven Semler has a think tank called Security Reform, SPRI. Uh, he's one of the great uh, analysts out there. Uh, please look up his think tank because he produces excellent work. And his graph here shows a uh, number of jobs supported by $250 billion in federal spending. And his conclusion, clean energy infrastructure support 42% more jobs than an equal investment in defense. Conversion. If it happens, it's a big if, but if it happens, it will likely be a combination of top-down and bottom-up. Top-down needs some form of congressional support, some form of congressional support, and in particular, a federal or state uh, jobs guarantee during the transition. The workers must be taken care of. And bottom-up, it's going to come from union strength, and perhaps worker cooperatives. Now that's a, an issue wherein the workers essentially seize control of the factories, the means of production as it were, the factories and the machinery. They know how to work the factories, they know how to work the machinery, they are the heart and soul of any given corporation, any given war corporation as well. And it is a incredibly bold move. It's been done before in the world, it has not been done before in the U.S. war industry, but um, it can happen. Bottom up. So the working class is rational. Workers know that the system screws them over. The workers produce the profit. Wall Street and corporate executives hog the profit. They take it. Organizing the workplace and bottom up conversion is risky. And if you just want an example of this, you see what workers tried to do at Amazon at the Bessemer, Alabama plant. They were organizing, Amazon went through incredible lengths to shut, it, shut down any possibility of workers organizing into a labor union. The corporation itself spent untold millions on anti-union uh, propaganda and really deceitful tactics in order to intimidate workers. And so, they, all corporations, war corporations including, included, can be expected to uh, behave that way, and they will. It takes incredible resources to survive the process of workplace organizing, let alone forcing workplace to change into a cooperative. The implications for organizing strategy from this are understanding the risks, bringing together the resources, whether it's a strike fund or housing, volunteer to house the workers wherever they may be, 
and solidarity from people outside, people elsewhere in Maine and people outside the state or wherever this may or may not take place. There are positive signs and I try to be positive during this. It's uh, overwhelming, but uh, as we wrap up here, conversion happened during COVID-19. And this is from David Swanson and I'll read it very briefly in full. When the coronavirus pandemic got going, money started dripping out of Congress for steps to mitigate the disaster. Senator Angus King called around and with almost no delay or apparent difficulty, Bath Ironworks agreed to immediately start manufacturing machines to produce special swabs used for testing for coronavirus. Numerous smaller companies were involved in the plan with little difficulty. And before you could say impossible, conversion had already happened. A weapons dealer was doing healthcare. Okay. The key there is uh, support from the top. As long as the money is flowing, corporations have no problem. Other examples. On Monday, General Electric factory workers in Massachusetts launched two separate protests demanding that the company convert its jet engine factories to make ventilators. I believe this was in Lynn, Massachusetts, which is northeast of Boston. Raytheon used its 3D printers to produce 10,000 face shields in 23 days. Quote, and this quote is from Raytheon Public Relations. All four Raytheon Technologies businesses joined the effort. Okay. Lockheed Martin, quote, partnered with Strategic Vaccines to help expand manufacturing capacity for the Flovid 20 inhaled treatment for COVID-19 patients. So it can happen, it can happen, but uh, the congressional support needs to be there and the federal dollars need to be flowing. Something else to think about, I will leave you with this thought. It is not, a, um, it is not an encouraging thought, but it needs to be broached at some point. Collapse. So it's not pleasant to think about, but it's a real possibility. As a species or as a planet, we are facing incredible problems. Climate change, as you all are aware of, and environmental collapse. That is to say, we're living right now through the sixth mass extinction recorded. Insects, fish, birds, megafauna, all going extinct at astonishing rates. The capitalist political class has shown no will to address these issues, none whatsoever. I bring this up because society locally and nationally will look very different in 20 years, will look very different in 30 years, will very look different in 40 years. Now, some of you won't be around for this. Uh, I might not be around for this, but uh, many of our loved ones will. And so it's important to have these discussions uh, at the right time and the right place. Why I bring this up for this particular presentation is because we can start thinking about how to use the infrastructure that is already in place when and if uh, collapse happens. So during and after collapse, as the possibilities of what is feasible and permissible broaden, how can locals utilize the industrial infrastructure that already exists in Maine? And this might include Bath Ironworks. So there is a chance, a very good chance that conversion won't happen that we will continue as a species to kick the can down the road and that environmental collapse will happen and that climate change will continue. And uh, we must be at least aware of that. We must start to think about it and to perhaps plan accordingly. So I leave you with a range of options and a range of things to think about, but um, we'll get into questions and answers. Thank you for your time, by the way. And thank you, Martha, again, and Peace Action Maine again for uh, hosting me. Yeah. I was trying to, I just want to thank you for your years of researching this and uh, keeping on, keeping on, because it's very overwhelming, huh? So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. It's, um, yeah, but, um, you know, we, we draw strength from one another and uh, groups like yours, Peace Action Maine, really, uh, you know, you all have been doing this longer than, uh, you know, in some cases longer than I've been around. And, um, you know, I draw, I draw strength from you and uh, we, we build on, our, you know, one another's work. And, uh, and we all, in many cases, stand on the shoulders of, you know, giants from, um, you know, peace movement back in whether the 60s or, you know, progressive movement in the, you know, 19 teens or, and, you know, back then, you know, worker struggles go back a, a, a long way. And yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I appreciate your comment. That's really nice. Yeah. Well, I think ultimately we draw our strength from our conscience, huh? 
<laughs> that's what well we said. Have, that's what we have to lie down at night with our conscience. Huh? <laughs> thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. No, thank you. Okay, I think we're all set unless one last call for any other questions and then we want to say thank you so much Christian for joining us and providing all of that inf information it's a bit overwhelming your book is totally overwhelming, but at the same time really helpful and informative and places to, to to focus on that's really great. Well, thank you all and thank you Martha and um, i'll be in touch, I will send you my slides and I will send you. Um, a series of articles that I came out with recently that are essentially the the um, the core of my book um, boiled down to uh, a much more uh, manageable form. So I'll, I'll send those along and then you can pass those along to the group. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch. And please, if you have any questions about any of this stuff, you know, don't hesitate to, to reach out. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to be sure to stop recording and share the chat. So I'm going to be doing that. You can all leave. And thank you so much for being here.